And I'm so excited, man. I'm so fucking excited. You have no yeah. idea. Um, I tried to keep it together. <laughs> when we were when we went to we were uh, both at the uh, MGM Grand Arena a few mm. weeks ago, uh, doing these shows with uh, Dave Chappelle and Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I arrived, they're like, "Yeah, so uh, here's the lineup." And I was like, "What's the lineup?" They're like, "Well, uh, so Donnell will go on, and then he'll bring you on." And then uh, Joe, and then Dave, and then Talib Kweli, and I was like, "What are you talking about? Right. What do you mean?" <laughs> you were all opening for me. Uh, yeah, well, we were all opening for you, but I was like, "What do you mean, Talib Kweli's right. here?" And, and the crowd walks out as I get all. But then we switched it up. Yeah, we the next did. Night, which was perfect. Yeah. Which was like get the crowd amped up yeah. with music. But I'm legitimately a huge fan, and I thank you, Tom. You know, I told you in that I was trying to be cool. I was like, "Hey, what's up, man?" And then <laughs> uh, you know, I talked to you about doing a podcast, and I'm so ha I'm so thankful that you're here. So thank you for coming. Well, first thank of all. you. I um, love the fact that you are so prolific in the podcast space that I had no clue which podcast I was showing up for. <laughs> <laughs> but Tom talks is a good one. That's a good one, man. It's a good one. Yeah, I uh, I sent you the Christian Hand one. I really enjoyed listening yeah, to that. That was really cool. That listening to that made me feel like because sometimes I have like, I don't know if it's survivor's guilt is the right term for it, uh -huh. but the fact that I get paid to talk, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears crafting these raps that no one wants to pay for anymore, uh -huh. but they'll pay me to talk. And um, sometimes I feel guilty about that because I'm like talking comes so, people can't talk, like everybody should be able to do this. Right. But when I hear your podcast with this guy, uh, Christian Hand, talking about his time working at G Street Records, and I'm like, well, I was there. I wasn't working there, but I was in those hallways and yeah. trying to get on as an artist. And I remember my friend, Makiba Mooncycle, who I sent a link. She used to work there at the time. So I'm like, I'm like, my voice is important because I was there in those rooms that he's talking about. Sure. Yeah. I, I think about a lot of times, I've said this to other people about different arts that they mm -hmm. succeed in. Mm -hmm. And then they'll flip it back and be like, well, you know, you're, you made it as a comedian or whatever. And that's crazy. I go, yeah, but. For some reason, I think it's preposterous to make it as a rapper. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right, Because it's just right. one of those things where, like, everyone, you know, people are like, check out my mixtape. I've had, you know, dozens of people do that. Right. Or, you know, you meet people and they're like, I'm rapping now. And you're like, that's great, man. Mm -hmm. But, like, to actually, to actually have the, the it happen where you are, you know. Uh, right. You're, and you're also, what as somebody who, 90% of the music I've listened to in my life is hip-hop, right? Uh, yeah, I could tell. And... I think you, I don't know if you agree, but you basically categorize MCs by, I think you can break up skill sets, mm -hmm. right? Like when, when rap started too, it was like, it was a new thing and everything and rap was like, I got a hat. <laughs> and I, and I, I got Did you see uh, Hannibal Buress making fun of early rap on yes. T Pain's podcast? Yes, yes. It was I was mad at myself for laughing at that. Oh, that, <laughs> that was so great. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, but like, you know, and then it progressed and, and it got more complicated, mm -hmm. but you are somebody who I would put in the highest level of like people who it's your vocabulary, your ability to tell the story, your, you can do the metaphors, double entendres and everything rhymes. And you know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's the highest form of art, I think in hip hop as an MC. Well, I appreciate that. I am, um, uh, first of all, thank you. Um, and, um, you know, before I address what you just said, um, when I met you, I had heard your name and I knew you had Netflix specials, but yeah. I weren't, I wasn't as familiar with your work as you probably were with as mine. For sure. Um, when you walked out on that stage before Joe Rogan and Dave Chappelle took stage and you were a surprise guest, right? Yeah. The way that the audience responded to you, they lost their shit. It was wild to me. Too. They lost, they were like, oh my God. It was, crazy. God <laughs> it was crazy. And I was like, okay, I need to pay more attention to what's going on here. And I've, I've since, you know, cause we're going to have a conversation later and I've since uh, taken in some of your, your art and your work. And I, I really have to say like, I really enjoy you as a performer, as an artist. Thank you, man. Um, but yeah, you know, Clark Kent was on my podcast, People's Party. And um, legendary DJ A and R for Jay Z Rockefeller Records. Great shoe collection too. Absolutely, the the don when it comes to Nike Air yep. Force Ones. Yep. I get angry when I see little white girls on the mall wearing them because I'm like, <laughs> you don't know who the fuck Clark Kent is. <laughs> yeah, How dare know. you scuff up those Air Force Ones and wear them with those jean shorts? <laughs> yeah. But I, I digress. Yeah. Um, Clark Kent said that um, it was all rap until it was rhyming. 
And he talks about like, you know, like what Melly Mel and them were doing back in the days and like that style that you just described, sure. that Hannibal was making fun of, that being rap. But when Rakim came on the scene, it was rhyming and you start to see the the layers and the double entendres yeah. and the deeper meanings. And um, yeah, I do that. Have you seen that chart that someone did scientifically of the rappers who have the best vocabulary? No. Yeah, there's a chart out there done by some institute. Really? And they, they use some sort of, sort of algorithm. I don't even know if that's the right word to use in this case, but some sort of scientific method to figure out which rappers had the best vocabulary. I've been fascinated by this yeah. like as be, be, from being a fan mm -hmm. a long time of hip hop and of vocabularies. Mm -hmm. And like when I had, we had Big Daddy Kane here, mm -hmm. I asked him, because I was like, you know, I <laughs> you go- Big Daddy Kane? Yeah, Big Daddy Kane was Did you here. do the black voice? Uh, I was, yeah, I was like, <laughs> stop, Kane! And he, he uh, I, I actually saw him at an airport and yelled it to him once. He yeah. was like, you gotta be straight. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but one of the things I asked him, and I always think this, mm -hmm. and actually I think I know the answer with you, I believe, mm -hmm. which is I go, did you read a lot? Did you, mm -hmm. were you a big reader? Now I know you worked in a bookstore. I did, so, and I owned a bookstore, I own a bookstore now. So to me, I was like, oh. They, Did he say he was a big reader? He actually, I, I kind of feel like I'm, that he, he was like, n like that he reads, but not like a somebody that consumes. Kane has an immaculate vocabulary. Incredible. Now. So his reading, his, his vocabulary probably comes from, if you pay attention to Kane, he leans heavily into like, he talks a lot about 70s movies and TV shows. Yes. And commercials and yes. cartoons and yep. eating cereal. And he's and, very well versed in all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. so I feel like even if it's not book knowledge, mm -hmm. it's like pop culture. Mm -hmm. You know, those guys from Kane's age, they know everything about pop culture. We were consuming it at right. such a voracious rate. Um, but yeah, Kane was up there, uh, Rakim, Eminem. The Wu-Tang dominates that- The vocabulary. That vocabulary thing. And, I, yeah. and it's interesting like to tie it back to what I brought up, that a lot of those guys bring up literature a lot, bring mm -hmm. up books a lot, you know, mm -hmm. RZA, Jizza for sure, talk about what they've been reading, like even in, in interviews, yeah. they'll be like, I'm reading this book, you yeah. know, or like, and then it goes into mathematics and, yeah. and everything that, they're, yeah. that they consume. But you were a big, a big reader, obviously. Yeah, my mother is an English professor, my father is a sociology professor, so that makes me a rapper if I'm born in Brooklyn. And by, <laughs> and by the way, I didn't know this because I was, you know, I've obviously listened to your music a lot, but I was just like, oh, you know, just do a quick Google thing, uh -huh. right? And I saw your brother's resume. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like smart quali. Dude. <laughs> Dude, I was like, this is, this is the greatest resume I've ever seen of anybody. Yeah. He went to Harvard. Yeah. Yale Law. Yeah. Clerked for uh, Supreme Court Justice. Uh, yeah, Judge Stevens. Stevens. Justice Stevens. And yeah. is a professor at Columbia Law. It's like, right. All right. And what's crazy is his wife did all those things too. And she's what? like a like a lawyer for like, like uh, uh, immigrants' rights. Um, and you know, his kids like play piano way better than me. Wow. Yeah, it's just amazing. I always picture myself at a dinner party with someone like that. And then they tell me like that. And I'm like, yeah, I wrote this <laughs> fart joke today. So, uh, you ever fart and, and you, nah, all right nah. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I, I i try not to drink coffee and you offer me coffee and this thing says big farts brewing on this yeah coffee mug. and that's my mother on the other side of it wow wow <laughs> yeah that's my mom <laughs> <laughs> but go back to what you said about yeah. um rappers being well read and being nerds yeah in my book vibrate higher in the first chapter maybe in the second paragraph I say that. I say rappers are just nerds. Really? Yeah. I mean, I just watch a Styles P. Um, you know, Styles P is in the locks. They are about to battle. I don't know when this is coming out, but they're about to battle soon next week. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're about to battle Dipset. Yeah. At Madison Square Garden. This is for verses. For verses. Yeah. And Styles P has been sort of you know trolling Jim Jones, and talking about yo, I'm gonna fuck up whoever is selling Jim Jones bad weed, because Jim Jones thinks he could beat Dipset, could beat the locks. Uh huh. And, um, you know, he'd been having fun with it, but he also got at one of these uh, uh, YouTube dudes, Hassan Campbell, I think his name is. I'm not too familiar with the gentleman, but uh, Styles P had an issue with him. And what he's saying in the video is, we could get on that tough guy shit all day. I do that tough guy shit all day, but that's my past. I've done that already. Right. Nerd up. I've never heard that phrase before. Not me neither. And he's like, nerd up. And I'm like, Styles P which by the way, I have a fantastic album with Styles P called The Seven and we went on the Seven tour and he's one of my favorite rappers. In my, he's dope. He's incredible. 
um, and he owns uh, juice bars, and he's he's um, fixing food deserts in the hood. Uh -huh. You know, he's real with it, and um, just to hear somebody like him with his jacket and his rap sheet talk about nerd up. Yeah. Well, I know we've reached a turning point in the culture. Right. Yeah. It's really like everything's changed. You know, I mean, culturally, as a consumer. I, I bring up sometimes the fact that when I was a kid, and probably when you were a kid too, you remember you used to go into music stores and it would just say rap, and it was a section smaller than the table when, when yeah. stuff first came out. And you knew every artist's name yeah. because there was only like 25 that had right. albums out. You know, right. It was like Run DMC and Eric B and Rakim and Queen Latifah and, and you know, like whatever, like 15 more. And you're like, that's rap. Yeah. And then now, I like that uh, Premier said it to me that he said, he goes, well, now it's we've given so much and now i get to like see the world and, and reach people that i'd never thought i would reach because it's it's spread out it's like yeah. it's changed it's grown and now now you look at at hip-hop or maybe black culture in general and you go it's not monolith it's it's every you know there's a nerd and then there's a tough dude and then yeah the, and it's it's what it should be yeah that that, that everyone's represented yeah so you know it's it's nice to see that you go it's not just one thing anymore. Yeah, and it's it's all about representation, right? And that's yeah. why representation is so important in, sure. in mass media. It's like it really does have an impact on not just how people see marginalized people or different groups of people, but it has an impact on how those people see themselves. Sure. And that's even like the worst problem. How people see themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see yourself represented. It has a huge impact on what you feel like is possible for you. I, I understand that. I think it's something that if you, if it's never been a thing for you, it's harder for people to understand, mm -hmm. you know, like I was, I don't forget who I was talk, telling <coughs> about that, but I was mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, you never consider it when you're white. Yeah. Like, why would you? There's never been like a first white anything. Right. You don't think, well, who's the first white guy to do this? You just yeah. assume that white people were already there doing it. Of course. <laughs> yeah. But the older you get, I think mm -hmm. the more you start to under, you're like, oh, oh, the, the world bigger than me yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i mean you know and part of it is like i don't know you could just you could make the case that uh a white parent should be explaining that. Like, like certainly mine didn't they weren't telling me about that you yeah know? um i had stretch armstrong on my show and he said something that was interesting that i feel like is it an experience that some white people have but not all white people have and he said his parents were were um you know progressive new yorkers in the 70s and they would drop him off in Harlem and be like, figure it out, mm -hmm. which seems extra. A little bit, you know yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, and you know, it's funny cause now I'm of the age where I'm like watching Net Netflix documentaries mm -hmm. and like there's all these documentaries and me and Stretch around around the same age, right? Yeah. All these documentaries like Fear City and Summer, Sons of Sam, yeah. where it was like there was 17 Sons of Sam. I didn't know that. Yeah. And it's like, New York City, 1977. I'm like, I was, I was two years old. What yeah. the fuck were my parents thinking? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Why did they Get have me out of here. Fair Fear yeah. City? Why was that the only option? Yeah, you know, yeah. they couldn't have been like black people in the 2000s and move to Atlanta. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what, what made them stay there? Everything that I see about uh, New York in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. makes it seem like the world is ending there. Yes, yeah. and I grew up in that. Yeah, and it seemed normal, like gunshots. Murder, burglary, getting mugged was just a thing. Do you got mugged? Yeah. See, yeah. That, that, how, I mean, we didn't call it mugged. Like yeah. mugged, like my father got mugged. Right. You know what I'm saying? I got robbed. You got robbed. <laughs> I got yeah. stuck up. Yeah, stuck up. Stuck <laughs> my up father got yeah. mugged. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, back then it was like my father had, had dealt with winos. Mm -hmm. You know, I had crackheads. Sure. You know, um, but it was just it was so normal and yeah, just it's just so crazy. Um, man, I forgot why I even brought up seventies New York. I don't know either, but but we'll get back. We'll to get it back to it. I wanted to ask you about this. So I called up one of my roommates from college, and I was like doing a podcast with Quali, right? Okay. And he was like, "No," and I couldn't believe it. He remembered. He remembered the street that I pulled up on, and I told him to get in the car. Mm -hmm. This is a small town in North Carolina, and I and it was Tuesday. Tuesdays when CDs came out. Mm -hmm. And I put in uh, Reflection Eternal, and he was like, oh, and the blast, I put on the blast, and he was like, what the fuck is this? Casey, mm -hmm. shout out to Casey. Um, 
And so then it got me thinking about that whole, to me, it was, there was a, something about almost prideful to hear Cincinnati in a song. Right. Because I was born there. I mean, I left when I was nine. We moved mm. around a lot. But hearing Cincinnati, you know, it just made me perk up. Because you always heard Brooklyn and, and yeah. you know, everywhere in New York. And then you heard West Coast stuff. And then eventually you heard down south, you know, stuff. But you never heard Cincinnati. And I heard Cincinnati and I got excited. And I love that album. And then I told you right before we recorded that I'd heard this, <laughs> you know, rumor yeah. that you said was somewhat uh ac- you know a right. little bit which was that i'd heard that after that album when you were going to do your next album you were looking for beats from producer whatever mm-hmm. people send me beats and that high tech reached out when we doing something and you're like well let's hear some beats from you mm-hmm. and he was like how about the whole last album we just <laughs> right, did? Right, right. and you said well it's not totally accurate but somewhat accurate right um yeah i'm impressed that you know that story because that's like deep deep underground rap industry shit you see what it is <laughs> it's got prop and quality fuck you man <laughs> um but yeah shout out to um high tech definitely um my podcast that i do with up rocks people's party is with jared meyer jared meyer was the founder of ruckus he's also the founder of um of up rocks and um it's all jared's fault okay <laughs> sorry okay um you know jared and brian brader they started a. Uh, Ruckus, a shout out to them uh, for starting Ruckus, and it was a beautiful situation for everybody. High Tech to this day always talks about how he misses those Ruckus days. Mm-hmm. But um, when I came out as an artist, when Reflection Eternal dropped, I began to have feature opportunities and touring opportunities, and so I, I stayed on the road. And since that time, I've been on the road until the pandemic, 200 days a year. Wow. Um, so High Tech didn't want to go on the road. As a producer, there were no mobile studios, no Pro Tools back then. As a producer, a hip hop producer, you need to be with your crates. Mm-hmm. He's sampling, he needs yeah. to be with his drum machines, his keyboards. And so uh, going on the road just wasn't appealing to him to sort of be on the road playing the role of Talib Kweli's DJ. Mm-hmm. Because that's essentially what he became with me, you know, opening for like Badu. Um, and so he got a solo deal from Ruckus. Um, instead of going on the road to work on a producer album. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yasin Bey, uh, I did Black Star with, he had a solo deal with MCA at that point. Yeah. And so I was committed to these groups. I wasn't focused on trying to be a solo artist. But when my partners had solo deals, I was like, well, I might as well get one too. Sure. And so I carved out, uh, with me and Jared carved out a thing where High Tech was going to get paid to do at least five beats on my new solo album. Mm-hmm. But the problem was is that me and High Tech had a disconnect over our disagreement about the touring. And, and that, it wasn't just touring. It was We had disagreements over who should manage us, other things, but it was, a, it was just a lot going on. And I was talking to the label and not talking to High Tech. High Tech was talking to the label and not talking to me. And as brothers and as, as creative partners, we should have been talking to each other. And that's the lesson there. Never let the label people, and I don't think that Jared, I know that Jared and Brian didn't have any bad intentions, but the way in which they were conveying the information created a rift with me and High Tech. And sure. so I believe that High Tech was be, I was I was telling Jared, well, look, um, let's make sure that High Tech gets on his album. Tell him to send me some beats mm-hmm. on some, so I can write to the beats. I think it got conveyed to High Tech. He needs to approve these beats. Right. Which is, you know, this is it's a confusing. There's a lot of little confusion. And you there. can you can see how hearing that can make someone go like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, yeah he didn't yeah. hear it from me. He's right. hearing it from the label guy. Yeah, you know, and um, and I wasn't thinking about honestly. I wasn't thinking about at all what I should be doing to make sure high tech is good because in my mind, by carving out five beats for him in the deal, and him getting him potentially getting paid for this, I was already looking out for him. But in retrospect, as a grown man and not like a kid who just started in his business, I know that the priority should have been the communication, right. not me trying to feel like I'm giving him, throwing him a bone, right, right. you know? Right. Um, and so we didn't speak for a couple of years. A couple of years. Um, he called me, I was in the movies a couple of years after that. And I was like, I'm, when I finish this movie, I'm gonna call you back. And yeah. we spoke and we never actually talked, we've never talked about this. Really? Yeah, we've never like, said, yeah, what was that bullshit? What was that? Yeah. We never talked about it. It just, we just went on with our yeah. friendship. 
Yeah, I had, a, I mean, not the same circumstance, obviously, but a similar thing mm -hmm. with, with a friend who I had worked with on something mm -hmm. and a deal didn't go through. And again, we were not communicating with each other mm -hmm. and it was, it felt kind of ugly, right? And in the end, we eventually were like, at time passed, mm -hmm. like more than a year passed and we spoke and we were like, we both were like, we could have handled that better. Yeah. And then, but then our friendship picked up, which is, which was great, you know? Yeah, I think, and we, me and High Tech definitely spoke about the 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 totality of our relationship mm -hmm. and how it could be better and, and things like that. But I don't think we ever particularly addressed that particular situation. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I'm glad you guys are on good terms now. Yeah, I mean, that's my brother, man. It's like I did not gain traction as great of an MC as I am, mm -hmm. and I definitely own my greatness, right? Yeah, I did not gain traction in the business until I started rap rhyming on high tech beats. I so I can't sense. underestimate how much that has helped me. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And then you guys, uh, you also, you mentioned the Black Star album mm -hmm. and it's been said that another one's coming. Yeah. We've completed another one. Um, you know, I'll play it for you one day if we get. Okay. <laughs> um, Yasin Bey has always been on the cutting edge. Like he really embodies the spirit of hip hop in his business as well. And so he doesn't want to do anything that's, corporate or too corporate uh -huh. you know we're all corporate to a degree but right too corporate um he doesn't want to do anything that he feels like is unfair he doesn't want to do anything that compromises his uh moral positions on how he feels like art should be valued and he strongly feels like the artists have to set the value for the art uh -huh. and so because of that the current systems that people mostly receive music through the way to set up the streaming and everything for for the way that the artists get paid, he's just not into it. And frankly, I agree with him. Um, you can still find my music on all these streaming services. Sure. But when it comes to Black Star, because my partner feels so strongly about it, well, as far as Black Star is concerned, we're trying to find a better way, a more liberated way to release this album. And we're very close. You are close. And I've said that for years but I really mean it this time. When you say um, you're finding, you're, in other words, you guys are finding something out of the norm of the way we're all consuming or the popular music is being consumed, right? That's correct, okay. that's correct. And um, there's a lot of things out there that are interesting. There's there's Bandcamp, yep. there's you know, there's OnlyFans. If we, yep. you know, there's, yeah. there's NFTs, there's yep. a lot of things, but I think we've, we're, we're finally honed into the right way for us to roll this out. Oh man, that's yeah. exciting. Yes. People are going to be excited about yeah, this. Yeah, I, I hope they will be. I think they will be. I wanted to ask you, um, so I asked you, I don't know, we talked about how Dave has been so good to to you, but mm -hmm. to hip hop also, he's such a fan. You know, when his show was the biggest fucking show on television, mm -hmm. uh, he always had, a, or often had hip hop artists on mm -hmm. and continues to, you know, he, he loves the music and it, it's a big part of his life. Uh, but I asked you how you guys met. Right. Can you tell that story? Because <laughs> yeah. it's it's kind of fucking hilarious. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I worked at a bookstore, bookstore called Inkiru Books, which I went to buy, and there was a customer who came in the bookstore, which is a phenomenal woman, just phenomenal woman, that I st started sort of dating and hanging out with, and we had a relationship that I thought was going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And she told me that she used to date Dave Chappelle, the comedian. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Nutty Professor was that, which I was actually watching last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, the guy that Eddie Murphy threw in the piano, he just, that's the guy? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, that guy. She's like, he's brilliant. I'm like, really? And she's like, um, you know, I was, she was older than me. And she, God bless her, she told me straight up, she was like, I'm going back to my ex-boyfriend, which was Dave. Oh, and you're like, what the fuck? Am I chopped liver? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what they used to say back in the day. What am yeah. I chopped liver? Yeah. Um, and um, I actually saw him in and around her building. Uh huh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was like she was cutting it really close. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, that's the dude that Eddie Murphy threw in the piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my only point of reference at that point. So did you give him, did you say, like, what's up? Like, did you say, yeah, like, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm hey, not man. a dick. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. But were you guys cordial? Like, or was it like, was it kind of standoffish? No, it wasn't standoffish no, at all. No. Like this, this, this woman owed me nothing. This man owed right. me nothing. And right. I was, I was very juvenile. I was too juvenile to keep this woman. Yeah. But I was old enough to understand that I wasn't owed anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a couple years later, uh, 
my manager at the time, Corey Smith, he was also managing De La Soul. De La Soul had a show at a college in Ohio, which Dave was now living in Ohio with his uh, family. Well, no, he wasn't. He was living there, but he hadn't started his family yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I go to the De La Soul show. I was hanging out with High Tech. We drove up to the show and Dave Chappelle's there. And I, I tell him this story. And he's like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty funny. And that was it. I was just, and by that time though, Half Baked was out. Okay. So I'm like, Half Baked is like a documentary about my life. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So I'm like, now I'm just like, yo, that's Dave Chappelle. Like he's a genius. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, and I'm just, I can't stop telling him how much I love Half Baked. Yeah. And how much those experiences in that movie, the really, and it's, it seems really goofy now, but that's really how I was living. Sure. Um. And at this time, uh, is this before any of your albums come out? When you're Black Star me? had to have been out. Oh, so it was out. Black Star was out. Okay. Reflection Eternal was not out. Right. Okay. Um, and so I'm like touring and hanging out with De La Soul at this point. Um, and then a couple of years after that, Dave and his uh, soon-to-be wife, Elaine, were walking down the street in the village. I have to assume they were on some sort of date. And... Um, I invited, I ran into them on 8th Street. I invited Dave to the Reflection Eternal album sessions. Um, he also was surprised that I was working with a guy from Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and he came to every session, almost every session. That's crazy. He would come to the session at Electric Lady. And at this time, D'Angelo, where's where's the, uh, where's Electric the... Lady's on 8th Street, across the street from, 8th um, uh, Street and 6th Ave. Okay. Studio that Jimi Hendrix built in Greenwich Village. Um, it's a magical studio. Uh, at this time, D'Angelo was with Questlove and James Poison and Pino Palladino in the basement recording Voodoo. Uh -huh. Common and Jay Dilla were on the second floor doing B. Jesus. And myself and High Tech were on the top floor doing Reflection Eternal. God damn, man. This is all at the same That's time. That's wild. You know, and Erica recorded her albums there and the Roots recorded several albums there. Um, but all this was happening at the same time. So Dave would just come, and this is how he met everybody, and this is what he tells everybody. He's like, I met all these people because I came to Quali Sessions. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, when you listen to that Reflection Eternal album, uh, Lennox Lewis is on it yep. because a friend of mine was dating him and brought him through. Really? Yeah. And anybody who walked into that into our studio, we made them get on the mic and say, Talib Kweli, High Tech, Reflection Eternal. Uh -huh. So like 88 Keys had some girls who came through and they couldn't pronounce my name. So that's a genuine thing? Yeah. That's genuine. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a cute, like, you know what I mean? It's such a genuinely sweet thing. Talib yeah, I yeah, can't yeah. say it. She, can't, she couldn't yeah, say it yeah. no matter what we told her. Yeah. Um, Gil Scott Heron, me and Yasin were working on a song for the Hurricane soundtrack, the mm -hmm. movie that Denzel was in about Ruben Hurricane Carter. And we were going to feature Gil Scott Heron on it. So he comes to the studio to, to do the song. And as soon as he comes to the studio, I have him say, this is Gil Scott Heron, you're on a train of thought, Talib Kweli High Tech. Yeah. And then he's like, I'm going to record the song with Black Star. And he falls asleep for like five hours. Really? And then he wakes up and he leaves and he never does the song. But at least I got that drop. <laughs> That's a great drop. But th those drops are real. Dave Chappelle heard those drops. And he's like, I want to do drops as people. So he did a drop as Rick James. Mm -hmm. and But his Rick James, he hadn't hung out with Charlie Murphy enough to hear the Rick James stories. Sure. So his Rick James was really Bootsy Collins. Okay. So he's doing a Bootsy Collins voice, but saying, what's up, everybody? This is Rick James. This is Rick James. Uh-huh. And, and he's doing, he did Bill Clinton, but I didn't use it because I felt like that wouldn't age well. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> That's a good thought. <laughs> and um, he did a... He did Nelson Mandela. Yeah, this is Nelson Mandela. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. And to this day, people ask me, how did I get, get Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Mandela. <laughs> on my album? <laughs> and DJ High Tech, he, yeah. he like really like strings it out, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, it's really good. It's he funny. was like, he was coming to the sessions and then going to the cellar at night. So he was trying his jokes out on us. And he was trying, he was doing this Nelson Mandela impersonation at the cellar. Yeah. So he was like trying it in the studio. So I just remember, I you know, sometimes you hear something and it just yeah. triggers something. Right. I uh, I remember being at the improv mm -hmm. and seeing Chris Rock. This is like, man, maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I just got back from South Africa. And uh, he goes, and I met Nelson Mandela. And mm -hmm. he goes, and then my, my opinion of Nelson Mandela immediately went down because he was willing to meet me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he goes, I got nothing to say to him. What That's am I supposed funny. to say, man? Hey, you got a new iPod? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. It's so funny. Yeah, man. Chris That's wild. That's wild that, that, A, that all those albums were being recorded there at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that I, I didn't know that all those drops were like from getting people to just walk in and genuinely... Yeah, you know. I think somebody just sent me a picture that we, of a photo shoot we did at that time. Um, but yeah, I was, I was obsessed with getting drops from people. I, I'm obsessed with drops. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Like on my other, on one of my 18 podcasts, we, um, <laughs> it's just it's drop crazy. It's just I love I love pull, pulling audio clips, whether it's a a word or a phrase, something that, you know, triggers something in your head. But it's um, it's like an addiction. Yeah, I don't know. We'll just, yeah, I'll show it to you later. Oh, there it is. This is from that time? This is from that era, yeah. Listen. So it's like Q-Tip, Jay Dilla, Common, Erica, D'Angelo, Questlove. Oh, my God. James Poyser. Amazing. And you guys were all in the building. Yeah. Amazing. That's a good photo, man. Yeah, in this photo, I'm wearing all Sean John. Oh, nice. Diddy gave me a bunch of clothes for this photo shoot. Hey, man. I, <laughs> Shout I, out to Diddy for all that free Sean John gear. There you go, man. <laughs> it was like Sean John, like, like, like purple label. Yeah. You know, it wasn't sure. like regular Sean John. You get it like Dr. J's. No, no. Yeah. But like, also, free gear is the best gear, man. Right. Yeah. Anything from Puff, too, I would just be like, okay, I'll just wear it. <laughs> right. I don't know. I'd be scared to get mad I didn't wear it, so... <laughs> I don't know who's going to show up. Why aren't you wearing your shot? I'm, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I once uh, did a writing session for Puff, and um, he didn't use any of the stuff that I wrote. Um, but um, I was maybe I was being too complicated. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, he actually sent me some Sean John shoes, uh -huh. which I'm like, who the fuck wears Sean John shoes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost felt like, are you trying to play me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of Sean John's shoes. Yeah, you never seen him, right? No, never. But he no, had him. He had him. There was whole ads in the source back then, I think, of Sean John's shoes. Anything that is you can purchase, I believe that that he's probably had. He's, or sold. <laughs> yeah, right? or sold, yeah. yeah. He's made that. You know, you could be like, construction has? Yeah, there's a puff one. Yeah, yeah, bad boy construction has. Bad boy construction has. <laughs> no. So what you mentioned earlier, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears for songwriting. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered, like, different people's approach to it. Mm -hmm. And for you, is is it like the song is about this, like a concept, and then, pen, you know, over um, and over? Every song is different. Now, I feel like I write more like a comedian now. Like Dave talks about the valley of the jokes and how jokes be like, pick me, pick me, and he uh -huh. just goes and just picks the jokes. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's how songs are for me at this point. But it wasn't always that. It was... um. You know, as, as rap, the type of hip hop I do, we rap a lot. I rapped a lot in my early career about the ubiquitous whack MC uh -huh. and how terrible he is. Yeah. How he's just the worst. Yeah, of course. And a lot of, so there's a lot of songs, a lot of classic hip hop songs about, that. about just how terrible other rappers are. And how I'm nice. Like I'm that, nice. Yeah. Like back in the days, it was, I'd literally be like the hook of a song. Yeah. You do a 16 bar verse and the hook be like, yeah, because I'm nice. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. somebody would cut a scratch. Yep. That's right, because I'm nice. Yeah. And um, I did a lot of that and I got very good at that. But then I started like living my life and having relationships and ch I had children early. So a lot of my early raps were inspired by my children. Um, I'll say this. I'm known for conscious rap, but I think that people don't give me enough props for my love songs. Mm -hmm. I will take the Pepsi challenge with any rapper. Yeah. Drake, LL Cool J, I don't care. Yeah. Any rapper on my love songs. Yeah, it'll be uh, the Fallen the Fallen in Love. What's the name? Uh, Never Been in Love. Never Been in Love. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's a good it's one. A, it's a good one. Um I um I really enjoy writing rap love songs. Really? Um yeah, because love, I mean love. Sure. Who doesn't love love? Yeah, of course. It's like the reason we do everything is love. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like one of my favorite things to rap about. Um but um Every song is different. Um, I wrote a song about uh, Brescia Meadows. She was a, a 14 year old, she's not that anymore, but 14 years old, she took a shotgun and shot her father in the face while he was sleeping. God damn. Because he had beat, beaten it on the whole family and like raping the whole family. And she went to jail 
and she there was a huge like fight to get her out and i participated in this and she got us she ended up getting out and i wrote a song about her and it was one of the most difficult songs I've ever had to write, it was called She's My Hero, because that's what her mother said mm -hmm. in the court. She was like, she's my hero. And it was like very difficult. Her mother's white, father's black, the girl's a mixed race, but identifies as a black woman, uh, black, black teenager, whatever. Um, so there's all these issues of race, power dynamics, sex, violence, gun laws, all these issues wrapped up in this one case. Yeah. And so I, I challenged myself to write this song, sure. you know, and I felt very conflicted about it. It's like, yeah, well, you have to obviously put a stop to that, but do you have a right to shoot somebody in the face? Right. You know, and should a 14 year old go to jail for that? Like, there's a lot of different- Did she go for a long time? Like... She went for like a year and a half okay. before she got out. Um, but it's like, I wrote that song because I felt like she looked, she resembled my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, what if my daughter was in that situation? Sure. Um, and then like she came to the show, you know, so now, now I'm like sitting with this woman and she's wow. like thanking me, this young lady, thanking me for writing a song about her, you know? And um, so it's like, I didn't write that with that intention, Sure. but that was like the songs sort of just be like, like Dave said, they shoot that song chose me. Right. Other songs, I'm just trying to just showcase my skills. I got you. Yeah. I mean, because you could make a case that like Miss Hill is a, it's a love, it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, not, it's, yeah, it's a love letter to Miss Hill. Yeah. Not, it's not like romantic. Right. But, but it's, it's still love. Yes. Yeah, it's it's love. still love. Absolutely. That's yeah. a beautiful song. Uh, Miss Hill, when I was working at Ankiru Books, um, John Forte was my best friend and he struck, struck up a, fr a friendship with Lauren Hill. She used to come to the bookstore. We used to go to movies together. Really? We used to exchange rhymes on the phone together. When she blew up, she took Black Star on tour. But we used to really be good friends, really good friends. And then she got into the music business and whatever she saw, I feel like somebody introduced her to the devil for real. Like whatever she saw, she was like, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, is not for me. I'm here to be spiritual. Mm -hmm. I'm here to be artistic and creative. All that industry shit, I'm not involved in any of that and so i feel like it made her success difficult for her because sure. at the same time she was becoming the most f successful female artist of all time like, 23 million records sold eight grammys in one year it was insane she's also like i don't want anything to do with any of this yeah and so when i went on tour with her we didn't speak i didn't see her that often she would like helicopter into the venue i would see her it'd be like a nod you know, a quick nod and acknowledgement, yeah. but there yeah. was no hanging out anymore. No, no relationship. Yeah. It was like she's she's in outer space. I'm still here on Earth. Right. And um, which has to be for any artist. I mean, to when that ha when you see this kind of thing that no one can plan for or mm -hmm. expect, like that album, the Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, mm -hmm. when it takes off in that way and you're catapulted. Literally, it feels like into space. It is. I don't know how how anyone manages that. Yeah, you know? it's outer space. You know, there's only certain artists who have achieved that. Like Kanye is so interesting to all of us because he's been in that outer space space for so long. Yeah. You know, and she was she was in that space for a couple of years. Yeah. So she pulled herself out of that space. Yeah. And then she she had went through all that controversy with the the who wrote what on the album. And so she did the acoustic album where she's like, Let me show you that I'm a real songwriter. Yes. And she allowed her voice to crack and to be vulnerable, which mm -hmm. Kanye goes on the sample to make a huge pop hit when all falls down mm -hmm. later on, mm -hmm. which is interesting parallel but she um stripped herself bare um and um she suffered for it and so that song comes out of i went to the bet awards and everybody was excited because it was like the return of miss hill mm -hmm. and as an artist i was successful enough to feel the pain of fans feeling like they bought you because they bought your product right I bought your album or I bought your comedy album or I went to yeah. your show so I get to tell you how to think or what to say. Right. I own you now because I spent money on you. Yeah. And it's like, well, you don't go to the deli where you buy a sandwich and be like, yo, because I bought this sandwich from you last week, I get to tell you what to think. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm but crazy. people do that to artists. They do, yes. And so I was very like pushing back against that a lot. And so I saw Lauren get up there and she read a poem and everybody was in the audience moaning and groaning. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and that's the first line that I wrote from that song, I wrote that sitting at, in the BT Awards. I was like, oh, you want her to be here, 
but you don't want to hear what she has to say. You want, you want that album basically. Yeah. Yeah. Which by the way, I'm guilty of. Yeah. Because I saw her at the Hollywood bowl mm -hmm. in, uh, Oh two. Okay. And I bought tickets mm -hmm. and, and then she did an acoustic set and I was like, I want to hear. Her <laughs> right. <laughs> What is this shit? I didn't pay I want to hear everything is everything. God damn it. Right. <laughs> like, so, right. Uh, right. Which I've been saying, I understand it. I, I mean, I literally feel like I lived through it. Yeah. I mean, she, that. um, that's how great that album is. Yeah. Um, and, um, wait, I want to ask you this though about that song. Mm -hmm. You write that song. It's always, like you said, it's like a love letter, mm -hmm. a, a, not a romantic love letter, but so do you get a call when it, you know, how did, how does she hear it? Or do, do you know how? Um, I had no relationship with Lauren or no way to reach her when I wrote that song. And um, I heard through channels that she liked the song. She never said to me that she liked the song, but I gotcha. heard that she liked it. Um, you might have to Google this. I might be getting this wrong. I think it's Ben, ben Folds. Mm -hmm. It was a sample for that. Okay. I'm not sure. And if I'm getting this wrong, forgive me, Ben Folds. But if I'm getting this right, fuck you, Ben Folds. <laughs> 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 Somebody should Google this before I get to. I think that's the sample for the song. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> Miss Hill. Let's see. Type in. Uh, it might not even be Ben Folds. I might owe Ben Folds an apology. Oh, really? Is it Jason Mraz? I don't know. I get all the white singers confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I got to tell you, me too. Okay, okay, okay. Not just me. Uh, um, ben Queller. There you go. Sorry, Ben Folds. I think what you do with the other four guys is pretty pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sorry for confusing so he's, the um, white guys. Two Bens. That's uh, all right, man. Ben Queller. Ben Queller. I don't even know words. who that is. I don't know who that. Can you Can you Google Ben Queller? Uh, let's see an image of him. So this song sampled his song. There's Ben Queller right there. Right. Um, he looks like other white guys. He looks like Beck. Kind of, yeah. In that picture. Yeah. Um, yeah, the producer I work with, and I'm not going to say his name because he's my friend and I don't want Ben Queller to be mad at him sure. and start dissing him. But, um, you know, gave me the beat and I handed it into the label and I thought the label cleared all the samples and they, they didn't. And this so, is like such an interesting part of your particular genre of music like yeah. that most people don't understand that happens clearing samples yeah. and how important it is it is and yeah. and you know hip hop early hip hop they didn't understand why they had to clear samples they didn't sure. get, get it um i'm all for paying an artists for their work and credit to sure. them and had i known that went on i would have definitely been like yes yeah. but a song came out and it wasn't handled and he just started dissing me this guy ben queller started dissing oh me. he did yeah he was very upset and I guess in retrospect, it's his heart. Yeah. He has a right to feel how he, how he feels. He was sampled. It wasn't cleared. Yeah, it wasn't cleared. But he was just like... How do they not... Like, you're a fucking... Like, how do they not clear it? You know what I mean? At, at that point. I was... That, this was song was on a project called Right About Now, which was like a small, smaller, like, mixtape project with which uh, Alan Grunblatt, which I forgot what it was called then. Was it Koch or E1 or something? But I don't know. This guy, Alan, is a... You know, he's a... This, not the he's not the guy okay you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice way of doing it <laughs> everybody in my business knows alan grumblatt and they all know that that's not the guy that's not the guy yeah. um but yeah so so miss hill yeah so robert glasper incredible musician mm -hmm. uh one of the best piano players in the world um he played with miss hill and did not enjoy his experience playing with her and talked about it um, like at length while he was doing a morning radio show. and Really? Yeah. And he said a lot of things that he, that he was talking to other musicians about. Uh, it was funny, but it was mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And Robert's a good friend of mine. Lauren is somebody who used to be my good friend. Sure. Um, but um, I had Robert on my show and we talked about it. And, um, I had actually written before before Robert did that. I wrote an essay called "In Defense of Miss Hill," mm -hmm. in which I was talking about how, as an artist, she doesn't owe us anything. She gave us miseducation. We we are all in her debt forever mm -hmm. because of miseducation. Sure. So if you paid for a ticket and you go to a Lauren Hill show and she doesn't show up, 
and you had to pay a babysitter and you and you it ruined your whole night. I'm sorry to hear that, but she still doesn't owe you anything. Mm-hmm. The promoter of the show and maybe the venue, they owe you your money back for your ticket. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Get your money back. Go home and go listen to Miss Education. Right. I remember what she gave you. Right. But she doesn't. She's not in your debt. Uh, artists are not products. It's not like you can put them on stage or turn them on. What you're paying for is an artistic experience. Yes. You're not paying for a dope artistic experience. Right. It's just an act, ar- artistic. Yeah. Experience. And if that experience is well, she didn't show up, or she showed up and she did it all acoustic, and that's just what it is. I know a dude in her band, mm-hmm. and uh, lately she's been sort of, you know, famously uh, trends for being late to shows. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I asked him, I was like, so what's that like? Right. And he goes, yeah, I asked her one time. I was like, hey, you know, fucking super late. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> like, what's going on? Uh-huh. And she was like, uh, did your check clear this week? <laughs> because she owed him. <laughs> right, right. And he was like, yeah. And she goes, all right then. <laughs> Just like, like walk over she, here. And, she's, and, that's, and that's why she's Miss Hill. Yep. You know, but um, my essay went viral again after the Robert Glasper thing. Uh-huh. And so she sent me a loving email, which I didn't even know that I could email Miss Hill. Right. I didn't know she had my email address. Yeah. She just, she's Miss Hill. She was like, sure. I'm going to email Kuali. Yes. Yep. And then, then yep. And this email comes through and she thanked, she thanked me for writing that essay. So I talked about the song in an essay, so she had to have known about it. Yeah. She thanked me for writing, writing that essay. And she thanked me for defending her, yeah. her. She also wrote an essay in response to Robert Glasper. Oh, she did. Yeah, she did. And um, I liked her essay. I thought it was a good response. I, Glasper had the right to say what he said. Sure. And Glasper is a musician, and he was st- standing up for other fellow musicians. Glasper is a working musician who got famous as a piano player, and that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. A lot of these working musicians who are the reason why we even do what we do, they don't. They all have to play the background. And Glasper was like the first one in a long time. And now you have, you know, Thundercat and Kamasi Washington, and that's all Glasper's click. Yeah. You have other guys who are starting to be like. Oh, really? He's he's part of that clique. Yeah, yeah. He's just Terrence Martin, Thundercat, Derek Thundercat Hodges. Thundercat was at the show. Chris too. Dave, uh, you know all these, yeah, you know, all Vegas. these guys who Kendrick and that whole crew had a lot to do with that because they started putting the musicians in the forefront. Yeah. But Glassboro, he's winning Grammys and shit. Yeah. So he's like, yo, I'm gonna speak up. Yeah. I mean, he has, like you said, he has a right to yeah. speak about his experience. But and are you guys cool? You guys are buddies. You said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I fuck with Glassboro a okay. lot. He's been on a lot of my records. Um, he, Glasper has done the music. He's, uh, does the music for a midnight miracle the mm-hmm. podcast with me, with, Dave and Yassine. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask you cause you mentioned Kanye. Have you by chance heard Donda or anything? The new, I haven't. No. You have not. Okay. I'm, I'm excited. To hear. I am too. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to go to a listening party, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll, at I'll the Mercedes Benz stadium, the Mercedes Benz stadium where apparently he's living now. I don't, I don't know. No, that's what I read. He's living there? They said he's living there until the album comes out. Like okay. That's the most Kanye thing ever. Super Kanye. Yeah. Especially if he lives there with the ski mask I on. think he's wearing the ski mask the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's outer space, man. He's in outer space. That's in outer space. He's yeah. dressed like he's in outer space. Literally, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, 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 Shout out to Jerry Lorenzo. Next thing he needs is just a helmet, some <laughs> right. oxygen. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Right. Um, the other thing you're also really well known for that I obviously observed over the years is like activism you know, speaking out on issues. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's a, almost like a compulsion to get, like some people, artists go like, um, you know, something's happening, Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. I make music. So I'll just, if I say something, I'll Mm -hmm. say it through my music. You going a step further than that, getting involved in things. Yeah. Um, I come from a black cultural nationalist background. So my parents were, you know, put me in, Afrocentric schools, and we wore dashikis, and we celebrated Kwanzaa. You know, we studied Malcolm X, and went to you know black art exhibits and all this type of stuff. And they named me Talib Kweli, they named my brother Jamal Kwame. So that's my foundation. And my parents were active in like anti-apartheid movements. My mother was active in like voter voter rights campaigns and stuff like that. And both my parents are professors, so. Yeah, my mother, my mother in particular would have us at museums and libraries when I was a kid. And hip hop, when I was in junior high school, veered into that territory. Mm-hmm. It was all about, it's a black thing, you want to understand, and Malcolm X, yeah. and X-Clan, and Poor Righteous Teachers. and, and um, I remember, because we're a similar age, mm-hmm. the era of like the, I would say, between like 91 and 94, mm-hmm. that in school, 
like all black kids would have Malcolm X shit on. Yeah. And and also like uh the African, you know medallions. Like medallions and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, I had a lot of medallions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um so when I started making music, it was that type of thing that informed my music. And I gotta say that you can't be the best. It and Biggie changed this. Mm-hmm. But before Biggie, you had to be conscious and pro black to be the best. Mm-hmm. Biggie was the first MC that people were like, okay, he's the best, where there was like no social redeeming value right. in the music. Like he's like, I'm gonna stick you up and I'm gonna fuck your pregnant girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. And then my homeboy <laughs> Gutter is gonna fuck your kids <laughs> and throw like, them over the bridge. No, this is the best. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, before Biggie, I mean, even Nas came before Biggie. Uh-huh. Nas but was socially doing conscious. Street shit, but he was yeah. doing socially yeah. conscious shit. Jay Z, Jay Z ushered in the era of the, the tough guy drug dealer rap. But as he got older, he became more more conscious. And I got a new song where I'm like, every single rapper over 40 turns conscious. And I'm like, congratulating them for finally getting to where I've always been. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, that that whole sort of black cultural nationalist thing. Like foundation, basically. It's my foundation. And I started getting gigs in that world before... I became known in like the music business. And um, I'll tell you, like in the like liberation movement world and activist world, well, there are a lot of rappers running around. Mm -hmm. And for for the sake of artistic conversation, well, not all of them are good. Some people just stay in that world because the only people who, the only audience that they appeal to are people who want to hear message music. Right. And so it was very important for me one, the message is paramount. It has to be, I can't do music that feel, I can, that's not true, I can. I do empty, vacuous music. I do decadent music, not that often. Mm-hmm. I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it at all. <laughs> but for me, the music that's most rewarding, that's a better way for me to say it. Sure. The music that's most rewarding for me personally, even though I enjoy like ratchet shit, for me is music that has message in it and stands the test of time. And, um, but... MC is master of ceremony. Like I can never start sacrifice the artistic yeah. intent and credibility and the need to be dope and the need to be nice. Yeah. And so when I tell people, people who like me, a lot of times people are like, yo, I like you so much because you're so conscious and you put the message. Like, yeah. that's cool, but that's yeah. not why you like me. Yeah. Because a lot of guys who are a lot smarter than me, a lot more conscious than me, and put the music, the message in music a lot more th- than I do. Right. But they're not dope. Right, right. You like me because I'm dope. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you almost, you touch on that in the, the, the what is it, Sons of Gotham, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's a little bit of like, you can't fuck with me in that. Yeah. yeah Sons of Gotham is a direct, I'm talking about specific individuals uh-huh. in that song. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that, there's a, something about like uh, that narrative. It's always been in hip hop. What we talked about earlier mm-hmm. of like, I'm dope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you are. You're dope. And that's why we like you. Well, I, I'm dope because I can recognize I know my superpowers, but I also know my limitations. Mm-hmm. And I know my place in the culture. I know what I've earned. I know when it's time to be humble. And I know when it's time to flex. And I know who's doper than me. And I probably won't tell you. Yeah. But I do know. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's, yeah, but that's like, that's wisdom, mm-hmm. I think. You know, I mean, I feel like exactly the same way when it comes to comedy. Mm-hmm. Like, exactly the same way. I know mm-hmm. my strengths. I know what they're not. I know, like, where I fit and where mm-hmm. I land and who's up there and who's not. But, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. Very similar. Um, what do I want to ask you? I'm sorry, I got it. I'm on pain pills. Hold on a second. That's all good. I'm still trying to remember why I was talking about old school New York. That's still like in the back. Yeah, I've been trying to get back to that, but I can't remember at all. So I'm just going to let it go. Um, I fucking, I just lost my train of thought. It's all good. You got notes. I know. <laughs> it says here you're a rapper. Yes. <laughs> you make music. Yep. Uh, it says, it says you're black. Check. That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> you know what's funny about that line of questioning? Yeah. Especially now in 2021 20, after like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and all these things we've seen that I remember when Obama got elected and I would do interviews and people would be like, so what you going to rap about now? Oh, yeah. It's over. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, I mean, 
what are your complaints now, man? Right, right, right. <laughs> President's black. What's your problem? Right. Um, this is what I wanted to ask you. Man. Is it at all important or how important is it? Do you give any care to one's ability to freestyle? It's a great question. Um, freestyling is, um, is a great art and it's a great workout. And it's like going to the comedy club is like, you know, roast battle, mm -hmm. and like, you know, just working shit out. Yep. Um, it's very important to your development as an artist. Um, when I was younger, one of my best friends in the world and one of my mentors was an artist named Supernatural. Supernatural, for my money, is the best freestyler I've ever seen or heard. Shout out to my man Nico Is, um, Brazilian artist that I signed that I feel like is on that level, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have the age and wisdom and experience of Supernatural. But Supernatural is my OG. And when I was in Washington Square Park, my freestyle level was like pew, pew, through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, like any muscle, if you don't work it out, you're gonna lose it. Yeah. And so as I became a professional rapper, I would freestyle less and less. And the freestyle became less and less important to me. Right. But then you have a reset as an artist. Like you, you do like the Beatles used to have be four guys like in a garage, and then they blew up, and now it's like Phil Spector wall of sound. Yeah. And now we're like, you know, we're like going to India, and we're doing like all this different type of uh, traditional Indian music and Hindu music, and then it's like, hold on, hold on, let's strip all that shit down and go back to like just us in the garage. And every musician who gets to a little bit of success goes through that. Yes. Where you get on. And you have all these new toys because you got all this money. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, your creative mind goes crazy. Yeah. Then after a few years, you're like, let me strip it down back to the basics. And freestyle was that for me. I found myself feeling bloated on stage, not good, sort of doing it by the numbers. Yeah. Like, you know, you know what it is. You know the words. Every audience yeah. you know the song. Yep. And started getting bored in that. And one love to Common because Common is a brilliant MC makes incredible hip hop music, an excellent actor. He can break dance, but he never ever stopped freestyling on stage, ever. And if you tour with Common, you see him using shortcuts as comedians do and everybody does. You're like, okay, well that wasn't freestyle. You said that three nights ago. Right. But you, you know, you, you're doing that, but Common has always put the improvisation into his show. Mm -hmm. And um, I did a tour with Common, I wanna say 2010, maybe, in, um, in Australia, uh, maybe it was later than that, but I watched him every night still doing it. And I'm like, I wonder if I could still do that. Mm -hmm. And I started to do that in my shows and I was rusty. But the challenge of getting back to the level to where I was like, at least I can go back and forth with Common on stage, it took a, a few days yeah. of like, okay, th tossing myself in the water and trying to do that. But it, it felt so good. When you find when you're like, oh, I got it back though, right? Yes. When you're like, I'm back. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I, there's a similar thing I feel like in stand up with um with crowd work because mm -hmm. you can like really get it. Like some guys never stop doing it, mm -hmm. but I think you know you do crowd work and then you get start doing bigger venues mm -hmm. and like the bigger the venue, it's kind of like more like putting on a show. Yeah. And then sometimes you go back to the club and you're like, oh, I haven't done crowd work now in a while. And it feels weird. You there's know? a venue in New York, <sighs> classic. And I love this name. It's called EO Dub. Mm -hmm. EO W, end of the week. It happens on Sundays, the end of the week, but they spell it week like W E A K, like the end of the week. Ah, okay. And it's like the premier venue. It used to be the Lyricist Lounge, but it now is like for years, it's been like the premier, uh, premier venue for like underground up and coming MCs to showcase their shit. Mm -hmm. And so for an artist like me who's more established, it's like a, a very revered honor to be asked to do it. Mm -hmm. Cause like, yo, we still see you as one of us. Right. And it's like, wow, man, you guys, aw, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, I did end of the week, Karis One was hosting. Oof. This was yeah. this was in like my bloated face. And so I'm doing these venues where the crowd is sh showing up to see me, regardless of how well I perform or not. Right. They're just here to see me do the blast and get by and yeah. take their selfies. And it's yeah. not even, it's, we're, all, we're all painting by numbers at this point. Right. And so now I have the opportunity to do end of the week. And I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta show that I still got it. And I did the whole show. I'd had like a half hour set and I was killing, I was killing. I freestyled, I, I showcased all the things. I did all the, pulled out all the tricks. Yeah. Got to get by. 
all of the words left. Could not remember, remember at all. Didn't remember any words from the song. Really? Yeah, it's like my brain was like, no, motherfucker, not this one. You don't do this one here. Ah. They know get by. They're just get by, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's like your hit. Like, yeah. why are you doing that here? My brain would not allow me to do the song. And you just. I just sort of flubbed and freestyled through it and come on, sing the hook. You guys know this one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't actually perform it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you were, your body, your brain was telling you, don't. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because I've got, I mean, I've had similar experiences where you go to like these, I don't know, like these more like alty underground shows where you, you start uh, like a big bit mm -hmm. where it feels like, no, nah, this nah. isn't for them. This is, you know right. what I mean? You got to do something almost like more high risk in that, yeah. in that type of setting. Yeah. About freestyling, one thing I've always wondered though, because you go, you know, shortcuts, right? You go like, you did that a few nights ago, you hear. When you're in some freestyle, sometimes you, like as a observer, somebody watching, you go, mm. Is that really off the top of his head? You know, and I assume like, do you always know? Do you feel like you always know when it's? I feel like I have the skill set to know when someone is freestyling, like completely free, no pre preconceived anything, or when someone is sort of doing bits. Yeah, remembering stuff they've written before. The best freestylers in the world, like Supernatural, I used to watch him, and it was like devices, like you know. If he says one bar, I know four bars later what's coming next. Where are you going to go? And it's like a container. It's like I, I'm going to interview uh, Bob Saget mm -hmm. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, so to interview him, I rewatched The Aristocrats, uh -huh. which I watched. When did The Aristocrats come out? 20 years ago? No, less than that. Um, I'm going to guess 12 to 15 years mm -hmm. ago. Oh, 15, 16 years ago. When it You're came right. out, I didn't get it. Oh, five. Yeah. I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who any of the comedians were. I didn't know Jeffrey Ross. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't hanging out with comedians all the time. I was like, who are all these white people with dirty mouths? Yeah. <laughs> and Whoopi Goldberg. What's going on here? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, why are yeah. they so, why are they so obsessed with anuses and gay sex? I'd never heard of this when I saw it, by the way. Right. And so the first half hour of it is people explaining the joke without telling you the joke. Yeah. Like, would you get the fucking joke? Yeah. And, um, but I rewatched it. And now because I spent all summer with comedians, yeah. well, now I fucking get it. Yeah. Now I'm like, I get it. I get why this is so important. Uh -huh. It's the structure. It's the container. And that's what a good freestyle has. It has containers that as long as you get, can get to the punchline or can get to the rhyme scheme, you can fit anything in that rhyme scheme. You already have the, rhyme, the best freestylers. They already have the container. They have the rhyme schemes planned out. Uh -huh. They just place things for the moment in those in the vehicles. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's fascinating, man. Yeah. Um, dude, this is a, a huge honor. Thank you for coming by today. Thank you. Thank you for chatting with me. Um, it was fun to do the, like I said, that I, I wrote a post about it and I, I've talked about it on podcast that those shows were like for having been through the pandemic like any other performer. Mm -hmm. And I'd been on stage, you know, some during it, um, a little bit before those shows. But those shows for me were like, I don't know, man. It was it was like, welcome back to, to the world. It was really nice. It was really nice, man. Did you feel nervous on stage? On stage? Not really. I, I was I was more nervous about, I didn't know how, how I would be received. Sometimes you're, and they were I like, guess, Whoa! it was crazy. Yeah. And then once once I felt that, I was like, oh. Oh, these are my people. Yeah. And then, yeah. The, sh and then the second night was even more so than that. Because now you knew how to navigate that. Yeah. Now you're like, okay, I know what this is. I know what this is. I'm yeah. going to go on like, Ugh. I'm so happy we did too, because the second night was... I thought the first night was, was bananas mm -hmm. and then the second night was even crazier for me. Yeah. And then, yeah, then just the hanging out and the, you know, going to the after parties and it was just fun, man. It was just such a fun, fun weekend. I hung out with Drake that night. Yeah, Drake was there. And he's the... like, he told, tells me a story about how he opened for me at the government in Toronto. What? He's like, did you know that? I was like, no. I'm like, he... you're just now telling me this? Really? <laughs> That's incredible, man. Yeah. That's, inc yeah, that was, that was just, I mean, and you know, Dave like just brings out like you just turn the corner and you're like who what the fuck are you doing here? I called Dave Gatsby that's my yeah. nickname for him yeah I said you curate the best rooms yeah you, you know, Dave puts together a room that is like okay this is the room I needed to be in yeah yeah it was awesome so a real pleasure man and I, thank you I will see you a little later yeah yeah I'm glad we're 
doing this. Yeah, me too, man. Uh, thanks for coming by. Thank you. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.